and has to play with his boy, Chris Paul. But if Chris Paul is not there, I it, could see you that. know, it's it's a slim to none chance. So, so you're you're now saying you think that Carmelo is definitely 100 percent done in New York? Not 100 percent. Not 100 percent, but like 90. percent They're li- leading. Pretty much, yeah. You I, can see I, it's I, leading. Get, yeah, they're leading towards getting him out the door. I a, mean, regardless, a, a percentage of Carmelo Anthony not being a Nick next year, I would say is 70 percent. 70%. 70%. So he still okay. have another okay, 30? Fair. Okay. I'd go a little higher than that. I might say 85. Ooh. I just think it's clear that Jackson doesn't want him. That's it's true. true. Jackson it's true. Want, he's going to make the situation miserable for him. Yeah, but it's Carmelo's call, too. But he's gonna ma- but Phil's going to make it so Melo just doesn't want to stay. No, I, I, I think that's what's going to happen, but I'm still saying that Carmelo has all the cards on the table. The best way to get rid of someone if you can't fire them is to make them quit. Yeah. And yeah. that's exactly what Phil is going to do. If it means absolutely blowing up the team and putting a team of scrubs around Carmelo, that's what Phil will do to get him out. I'm not kidding. It could, you know, at but the same Phil time, has, though, I, it could go the other way, and it could really motivate Carmelo to like mm, really step up his game. But it's kind of, it's kind of too motivated. late it, in the game. I know, but I know, but I'm just motivated. saying, it, it's just another just scenario saying. that could happen. You know, he obviously knows that he's trying to get him to leave, so he's like, you know what, I'm going to take this opportunity and prove you wrong. I doubt that's going to be the situation. Could but happen. and look at this upcoming draft. I've, I've got reports that Phil's going for another European player this year. I actually like him, and he's about he, six eleven, something like that. I don't know his name. Nakilta or something like that. He's, okay. from he's from France, and he's a he's a shooting guard Ball slash shots. point point guard, and he's very elusive. And Actually, he can score the ball. I, I I can't really describe his game, but do you see Emmanuel Moutier play? Because that that's who he reminds me of. Yeah, I, I've seen Moutier play. Okay, all right, I he, see you. Which people wanted the Knicks to get in, the, in that draft? Yeah, that year. but they but, took Porzingis. Yep. It worked out. Honestly, I wanted Justice Winslow. You are listening to Beyond the Game on the Voice of Nassau player. Community College, ninety point three WHPC. I am Jake Volk. Sitting across from me, Brandon Johnson, Dominic Arbolino, and Eric Fischetti. Number to call if you have something on your mind is 516-572-7440. And we have to touch on a sensitive topic here. The rivalry between the Orioles and the Red Sox has reached a new low. With both teams going back and forth at each other on the field, Adam Jones said that he's been the subject of racist comments at Fenway Park. C.C. Sabathia also said that he's been the recipient of racist remarks at Fenway. On Tuesday, a fan was ejected from Fenway for saying racial slurs. Brandon, as the only African-American in the studio, you offer a unique perspective that no one else here has. What are your thoughts on this? You know, absolutely. Thank you, Jacob. Um, You're very welcome. And this is a topic that relates to all people. I mean, I understand this is targeted towards us, but everyone can have an opinion on this. But it's very controversial when you hear stuff like this because... When you look about the history of sports, I would have to say baseball was probably the first most racist sport. Yes. yes. And, and, and anyone, can, anyone can argue that because you had guys like Jackie Robinson who just came into the league. who was probably the first, I think the first black Ty player. Co- yes, Jackie Robinson yes. was the first black player in, in the league. major league. So, and, yes. you know, he would always, you know, receive, you know, racial slurs like this and... Mm. <clears throat> He basically started the trend for more African Americans to join the sport, and he, each and every other sport too, as like well. Like Campy, Monty Irvin, yes. Larry Doby. Yes, absolutely. And you know, when you hear things like this, you see how like our country is still in the same state of how we were back in the days, and it's just immature. And you know, it's sad to hear stuff like this because we all deserve equal opportunity. You know, we're all in the same country. We both have the same talent, same abilities to do anything we put our mind to. And this is very emotional to talk about because it's not right for people to keep acting like this. No, it's because not. Because we all pay our money to see players play, regardless of what co- color you are, you know what I mean? It's just it's just the right thing to do to just keep your comments to yourself and just watch the game. If you have a problem with someone, you talk about it individually, but you don't throw stuff at us because we have uh, another color, you know what I mean? That's just not right at all. No, of course not. And, and we still go through social injustice nowadays, no matter what the case may be. We have... People getting killed. I mean, in the streets each and every day. So when we when we do sports, it brings us together. It should not be be like people being separated from you know from racism. Take a pause. You know, no, I'm good. I'm good. You know, it's just it's just things going in my mind right now. But you're emotional. It's just it's just hard, man. But my thing to this, I just want to end off saying that you know, for 
I'm glad they took the right, you know, direction to eject the players and, you know, Boston clapping for Adam Jones when he that was came onto the plate. Yeah, you know, nice. I respect yeah. that, but this just has to end. But I don't think it ever will, guys. You so, know what? You know, hey. you know what you get for that? You get this. You get All the right. applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And yeah. I don't give that lightly. That was excellent. Appreciate that. That was very yeah. well put. So, you know, hey. And Boston fans, for the most part, are good fans. Of course, there are a few apples that spoil a bunch. Eric, you had mentioned to me that someone had threw a beer bottle at you when you were 10. Yep. I've been the subject of it when I've gone to Fenway Park. The majority of them are good fans. It is disgusting to see. I love going to Fenway Park. Mm-hmm. Fenway Park is a great place to watch a game. It's gorgeous. There's nothing, there's nothing better to me than watching a Yankee Red Sox game at Fenway Park eating a Fenway Frank. It's a great way to spend an afternoon. This is disgusting. It's reviled, Brandon. I think you hit the, um, the nail on the head. This is disgusting. It, is. it needs to stop. If you guys want to throw at each other on the field, that's fine. You're hurting yourselves for our pleasure. That's fine. But don't make any racist remarks. It's so sickening. Cool, man. And, and it's so definitely cool. a stupid reason, too. It's just because, also, they're on the opposing team. Like, I feel like this just... Because they, they're not going to say that about no. any of the Red Sox players. They, like, nev- they never say it to Big Pop. Exactly. That's nope. what I'm saying. So they I never just, say it to Hanley. And, you know, they're putting on a show for us. No matter what color they are, they're all putting <clears throat> on a show for us. We're paying for these games. Why would you even want to do something like that? And then eventually get kicked out for it, too. That's just one, a waste of your money, too. You're just, you just ruined it for yourself. Man. And you know what really bothers me about it? You said that uh, CeCe Sabathia was, was um, at, at the heart of it, too. This I wouldn't been... say he's at the heart of it. He no, said I, mean, he's... I mean, like, he was a part of it. Excuse me. Yes. This happened before, and no one said a word. If, when? I'm not no, saying no, no, you're a uh, liar. When? No, because he just said, as you read that, uh, he, he's been the recipient of remarks. Yeah, but so, he never went, did, did he ever go public with it? I don't know. I don't think he did. I, I don't know, but if it's true, and it's oh, happened you're before... Oh, saying it's an epidemic. Okay, yes, I am saying. saying. Yeah. I'm saying that yes, if this yes. is actually true, because personally, I don't think anyone would lie about that. Kurt Schilling... Who I actually like. I, I agree with a lot of his political views. I'm very hardcore conservative. I am. I'm not afraid to admit that. He said that Adam Jones is lying to put on a show. Kurt Schilling, you need to shut your mouth. Yeah. Who the hell would make this stuff up? I mean, here's, here's what you don't understand, Kurt. You played for the Red Sox. You, you, you were there for those golden years where you beat our Yankees. <laughs> you know, it, it's sickening for you to say something like this. Yeah, You're true. not there. You're not seeing this. I'm Caucasian and I'm getting upset over it. It's sickening. Stay on Breitbart, for God's sake. You'll be right at home with Steve Bannon. <laughs> oh, God. It, it's disgusting. And this going, is disgusting. Going back to your point, Eric, it's been happening, like, all the time. You just might not hear about it. Like, personally, no, I mean, whenever I'm at a game, like, let's say it, it was the Jet Giant game um, that last year, not that this past season, but, like, even all the way up, like obviously the players aren't going to hear it, but you just hear these fans like screaming such terrible things to like if, say if a player does well or because it's against your team. It's just it's so stupid, sickening. It's, it's absolutely it's sickening. awful. You know what? We got to take a break. Don't go anywhere because we will have an exclusive interview with author Tom Van Riper. He just came out with his book Cincinnati Red and Dodger Blue, baseball's greatest forgotten rivalry. It's coming up next on the Voice of Nassau Community College ninety point three. WHPC. Ranger Station, Ranger speaking. Hi, um, I'd like to report a bear hug. Uh huh, okay. Well, we were building a bonfire, and I, I saw some, like, dry brush and leaves around, so, you know, I, I said to move the bonfire somewhere else, and out of nowhere, Smoky Bear shows up and hugs me. So you noticed some wildfire hazards and moved your bonfire to a safer location. Yeah. Yeah, that's Smokey, all right. He likes it when people help prevent wildfires. It hits him close to home. Not everybody gets the hug, my friend. So that's pretty special to get a hug from Smokey Bear. Huh, so it was him. Hey, guys, I told you it was Smokey. Okay, well, congratulations, my friend. And thanks for calling. There are many ways to prevent a wildfire. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Only you can prevent wildfires. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service, Ad Council, and your state forest. You know the feeling when you hear sounds of hip-hop and reggae? Well, you're in for a treat. It's flavorful. What? Extraordinary. Really? And mind-blowing. It's saucy. Tune into It's Saucy, where I cook up and dish out the latest news in hip-hop and reggae. There will be interviews with artists and students, along with trending topics on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. This is your voice for all things saucy. Oh, 
saucy. You don't want to miss out. This is DJ Steph. Woo! Listen to me on Wednesday nights at 9 o'clock here on The Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Kaya weighed just one pound, one ounce at birth and endured a grueling 163 days in the hospital. Her story has a happy ending, but many of the one in 10 babies born prematurely in the United States do not. You can change that. Give babies like Kaya a chance to be born healthy by helping the March of Dimes fund research and programs that fight premature birth. Give families hope. Sign up today at marchforbabies.org. You are listening to Beyond the Game on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. I'm Jake Volk. Sitting across from me, Brandon Johnson, Dominic Arbolino, and Eric Fischetti. And we are fortunate enough to be joined by Tom Van Riper. He is the author of Cincinnati Red and Dodger Blue, baseball's greatest forgotten rivalry. Tom, how are you? I'm good, Jacob. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for doing this. So, what exactly is your book about? Well, basically, it's uh, kind of a baseball uh, history book. It's about baseball in the 1970s, um, something you guys wouldn't remember. Um, <laughs> Definitely not. Obviously, oh, and I don't know about that many of your listeners, but, but what, what I'm saying is, uh, in terms of promoting the book, and, you know, people ask me who would like this book, and I say, well, okay, mainly if you're old enough to remember that era and you grew up during that time, I think you would like it. But I think even the younger fans um, who have an interest in baseball history would like it. It's just a, a book about uh, a great rivalry of the day, the Cincinnati Reds and the Los Angeles Dodgers, um, a matchup that no one sees as anything special now, um, especially since baseball realigned in the mid-1990s uh, and the two teams don't even play in the same division anymore. Um, but back at that time, in the 1970s, the Reds and the Dodgers were both in the National League West, both superpowers for several years at the same time, and they had great battles back in those days, produced a lot of star players, a lot of high-profile players who were really the national faces of the game during a time as baseball was just leading into free agency, just leading into more television money, multiple network contracts. These were the teams that were, uh, that were not only dominant on the field but were really driving the audience um, at a pretty important time in baseball history. So I was just trying to kind of recapture that and, and tell that whole story. Okay. Can you go into detail on the games between the Reds and the Dodgers? Yeah, I mean, they had, as I said, these were two powerhouse teams in the National League West. Um, let me see. In seven of nine years, from 1970 through 78, one or the other was in the World Series. Uh, in terms of the, in terms of the games head to head, you're talking about yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, you know what the what the overall record was during those ten or twelve years. I couldn't say exactly. Um, my book, I can say, was set. It set primarily in the 1973 season uh, wow. when the two teams had a had a great race. The Dodgers had an 11 game lead midway through the season. The Reds came storming back to win the division. Um, and, you know, kind of use that season to jump off and talk about other parts of the era, but mainly it's set in the 1973 season. Um, there's one series I can talk about sort of specifically in the middle of the season. The Dodgers came into Cincinnati with a 10-game lead, four-game series, including a doubleheader in the middle. Dodgers won a 13-inning game on Friday night to lead by 11 games. The next day, Don Sutton, their future Hall of Fame pitcher, is beating the Reds 3-1 to in the ninth inning in the first game of a doubleheader. Two outs in the ninth, a couple of men on base. He's one out away from pitching the Dodgers to a 12-game lead. And a journeyman catcher, lefty pinch hitter type, whose name was Hal King, kind of a, kind of a journeyman player who was near the end of his career, comes up, pinch hits, hits a home run to right field. Reds win the game 4-3. to they go on and win the next game, the second game of the doubleheader in 10 innings. And then the next night, they win on a walk-off hit in the bottom of the ninth. So within one day, instead of being 12 games out, the Reds were eight games out with still about half the season to go. And they caught fire after that and uh, and basically caught the Dodgers to win the division. A guy currently uh, out in Cincinnati who I talked to told me that to this day in Cincinnati, when there's a big home run, the fans call it a Hal King moment because that just... <laughs> it was a it was a huge home run by an obscure player that turned the season right around. That that was really the highlight of their uh, of their matchups during that era. All right. 
Do you have any funny stories that you can share with us pertaining to you writing this book? Funny stories? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> funny stories. I'd have to think about that. You have any jokes? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you. All right. No, no you know, I, I would have some, I, uh, you know, it, it was interesting stories. When you talk to the guys now, it would be great. You know, part of me as a journalist wanted to see some, it, it would have been great to get. 